Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this meditation session. Let us take a moment to arrive in front of our device on our cushion or on our chair. We can take we can do that by taking three deep breaths. Every time we inhale, we try to refresh our attention. And every time we exhale, we relax. Now let us take a look at our body posture for this session. So <clears throat> the best is to sit on the floor, but if you're sitting on the chair, it's perfectly fine. Just make sure you're not leaning against the support of the chair and not leaning forward either. If you're sitting on the floor, the best is to sit in the full lotus posture with each foot on top of the opposite leg. That might be a little bit difficult, so make sure you're not pushing your body. If you're not familiar uh, with this posture, make sure you're not forcing yourself. Um, you can simply sit cross-legged or you can sit in a half lotus or even Burmese style with one leg in front of the other. If you're sitting on the chair, ideally you have your two feet flat on the ground. If your feet are not touching the ground, maybe you can place a cushion under your feet so that they are flat. We place the hands traditionally in the concentration mudra. So you have your right hand on top of the left, the two thumbs are slightly touching, and this mudra rests on your lap. The back is straight, the body is upright. You can imagine that there is a string pulling from the crown of your head, keeping your body upright. While the back is straight, at the same time, it remains, your body remains flexible. You can easily turn from left to right like this. The shoulders are even and relaxed. The neck is aligned in the continuation of the spine. You can very slightly tilt the head forward, but not much. You can place your tongue <clears throat> just behind the upper teeth towards the upper palate. This helps to reduce the production of saliva while you meditate. And finally, the eyes are not completely closed. We leave them slightly opened, gazing one or two meters in the space in front of us, about 45 degrees cast down. But we don't actually pay attention to what our eyes are seeing. It is the mental consciousness that meditates. Leaving the eyes slightly opened allows for some light to enter. <coughs> And this helps keeping you alert while you meditate. This posture is known as the seven point Buddha Varuchana posture. And out of the seven points, the most important is for your body to be upright, for your back to be straight. Now that we looked at our body posture, let us take a look at our mind. And let us try to generate a good motivation for this session, a Mahayana motivation. Mahayana is Sanskrit for the great vehicle. And what makes it great is actually its entry door, which is bodhicitta in Sanskrit, which means the mind of awakening. The mind of awakening is this wish, this aspiration to achieve a state of full awakening in order to benefit countless sentient beings. Sentient beings in Tibetan it is Semchen. Semchen literally means mind possessors, all those beings who are endowed with a mind. And why we want to help them is because we recognize that since time immemorial, since beginningless time, 
sentient beings have been trapped in the vicious prison of their own mind. All sentient beings actually includes ourselves. Until we achieve awakening, we are also one of the countless sentient beings. And we are continuously, since beginningless time, circling in what is called samsara in Sanskrit, which is cyclic existence. Continuously, we are taking rebirth in all the different, different realms of samsara. Sometimes we are born as human, sometimes we are born as an animal, sometimes we are born in the Preta realm, sometimes we are born in the Sura or the Asura realm. But mostly, since time immemorial, we have spent Eternity in the law realms, in unfortunate states of rebirth, because of the karmas we have accumulated in the past. Every action we do almost 24 hours a day is motivated by so much concern, you know, for temporary pleasure, temporary happiness. We don't want to experience pain, we want to experience happiness. But we are actually looking in the wrong place. Sometimes for our own happiness, you know, we might engage in actions of lying, deceiving others. Sometimes we might even steal something for our own pleasure, for our own happiness. And such actions, such non-virtuous negative actions, they leave a negative imprint on our mental continuum. Every time we engage in such an action, we accumulate negative karma. And since beginningless time, in countless past lives, we have accumulated so many of those. So many times, for example, we have been reborn as humans, uh, sorry, as animals. <clears throat> animals in the wilderness. Constantly, you know, hunting other animals in order to feed ourselves. So therefore, constantly engaging in the karma of taking the lives of others, engaging in the karma of killing. So this is just an example of the countless karmas we have accumulated in the past. So we engage in such actions <clears throat> because of our afflictions, because of our mental delusions, because of our attachment, attachment to pleasure, attachment to ourselves, because of our anger. When we don't obtain what we want, we tend to get angry and out of anger, you know, we might shout at someone, we might harm someone, we might kill someone. Other afflictions include <clears throat> jealousy, for example, pride, depression, anxiety, all these mental states, they make us engage in negative actions. And all these mental states, all these afflictions, all these negative emotions, all of them, without exception, are rooted 
in what is called self-grasping ignorance. Since time immemorial, since beginningless time, we have been apprehending the world, we have been apprehending reality, we have been apprehending ourselves, we have been apprehending whatever happens around us, whatever we see, whatever we experience. We have this misconception that everything exists very solidly. We apprehend phenomena as if they exist truly, as if they exist intrinsically, inherently, as if they exist objectively from their own side, as if they are totally independent from our minds. Because of this misconception, we have the feeling that we are the center of the universe. We feel that everything resolve, revolves around us. And this leads us to feel that we are more important than others. This is completely, you know, completely wrong. <clears throat> if we check, if we analyze, others are numberless. I am only one. And others, just like myself, want to be happy. Others, just like myself, want to avoid suffering. So there is absolutely no logic behind this feeling, this impression that I am the center of the universe, that I'm more important than others. So because of this self-grasping ignorance, apprehending phenomena, as existing so solidly real, so objectively, so intrinsically from their own side, because of this impression that I'm the center of the universe, all these afflictions arise. Attachment, anger, jealousy, pride, and so on and so forth. And because of these constantly, since time immemorial, engaging in non-virtuous actions, accumulating negative karmas, and whatever we experience is the result of the karmas we have accumulated in the past. Even the good actions we do, the virtuous actions we do, such as helping others, such as practicing generosity, because they are contaminated by this self-grasping ignorance, this apprehension that phenomena exist truly, because of that, even these good actions, yes, they are positive, yes, they are virtuous, yes, they accumulate karmas that are positive, but <clears throat> contaminated positive karmas, meaning that they will ripen in a pleasant experience, in an experience of pleasure or happiness within samsara, within cyclic existence. Like all the conditions we have now, probably most of you are also here in India, and these days it is very hot. We have the fortune to have the fans, the AC, a shelter. All these conditions that we have, this human body, we have access to water, to food, and so on and so forth. All this is due to the positive karmas we have accumulated in the past. But whatever we experience is happening within this cyclic existence, within this samsara, meaning that we don't have control. When causes and conditions come together, any karma that we have accumulated in the past can ripen. At any time, you know, this human life that we have at the present, at any time this precious life can end. At any time the AC can stop. At any time, you know, we might lose all our money and possessions. It happens so many times in the history of humanity. 
people who lose everything from one day to the other, or people who suddenly become very sick because causes and conditions allow for karmas to ripen, karmas that have been accumulated in the past. So at the present we have very good conditions as humans, but we can see around us so many humans don't have the conditions that we have. In this heat I find it very easy to relate to others who don't have these conditions, you know, when you just when you just go out of your house and you see so many people living in the street, you know, spending their days outside in this intense heat, no fan, no AC, no shelter. We can also relate to people who are sick. We can relate to people who live in countries that are at war. We can relate to animals how much suffering there is in the animal realm. So the Buddha tells us that we have been circling from life to life since time immemorial. All of us, countless sentient beings, all of this is dictated by the karmas we have accumulated due to our afflictions. It is said that the worst, you know, state of existence, the worst realm, are the worst realms actually are the hell realms. There are countless hell realms where we are in such a mental state that we see everything as negative and all the experiences we have as just pain, just painful experiences constantly. And this lasts for eons and eons and eons until the very negative karmas that we have accumulated that propelled us in that mental state until all these karmas are exhausted. In the hell realms there are countless sentient beings. So many that the other realms look totally empty compared to the hell realms. If we take the Preter realm, for example, compared to the hell realms, it looks empty, totally empty. But actually there are also numberless Pretas. And the Preter realm, you know, next to the animal realm, the animal realm looks totally empty compared to the Preter realm. But there are also countless animals, this we can easily see, you know, with our own eyes. We can see, just if we think about ants, for example, that are living on the planet, there are numberless ants on the planet. In comparison to that, only 8 billion human beings living on the planet. The human realm looks totally empty compared to the animal realm. And even among the 8 billion human beings on the planet, you know, how many you know, have a decent life. And how many, you know, have the time and the interest to look at their mind. So few, very little. How many have the fortune, you know, to meet the teachings of the Buddha and study the teachings of the Buddha? Very, very few. Let us try to generate a sense of compassion for all sentient beings who are trapped in samsara, who are trapped in the prison of their own mind. Let us wish for all sentient beings to be free from suffering and the causes of suffering, the karmas and the afflictions. Let us also try to generate a sense of responsibility for all sentient beings, because at the moment we have this human life 
that is qualified with so many freedoms, so many endowments. We have all our physical, mental capacities. And we live in a world where the Buddha has appeared, the Buddha has taught the methods to free our minds, to liberate ourselves. The teachings of the Buddha are still very much available to this day, especially in this digital era with just one click, you know, we can read the sutras, we can listen to very qualified masters, such as His Holiness the Dalai Lama. So many hours of teachings of His Holiness are available just on YouTube, you know, just with one click. We can listen, and contemplate and study how fortunate we are. There are also so many <clears throat> followers of the Buddha's teachings who can help us, you know, understand our mind. And so many supporters who allow for Dharma centers to exist. So many Dharma centers around the world, such as Tushita, due to the generosity of so many people. So with all these conditions, we have what is called the precious human life. We have this incredible opportunity to look inside, to transform our minds, to eliminate all the afflictions, to purify all the karmas. While so many beings don't even have the thought to look inside, so caught up in samsara. So let us try to generate a sense of responsibility for them. Let us try to generate the wish, recognizing I have this incredible, rare opportunity. For them, I will transform my mind. I will liberate them. They have been so kind to me in countless past lives. Even in this life, everything I have, everything I know is due to the kindness of others. Just this device that we are using, this AC, this fan, this shelter, the food, the roads, everything that we have is due to the kindness of others. The fact that we can even understand English is due to the kindness of others. We have been taught how to speak English. So for them, I will do the work on my mind. I will liberate my mind. And I will liberate all of them, without exception. So in order to do that first, I must recognize that I am also under the sway of the afflictions, under the sway of self-grasping ignorance, experiencing the results of the karmas I have accumulated in the past. So first, I must purify my mind. I must liberate myself from samsara by eliminating all the afflictions. And in order to help sentient beings best, I must achieve the state of full awakening, the state of omniscience, the state of a Buddha, knowing perfectly how to guide sentient beings. <clears throat> Let us try to give rise to this most beautiful mind of bodhicitta by thinking, may I become a Buddha for the benefit of all sentient beings. And with this thought in mind, we will engage in a short shamatha practice. Shamatha is the Sanskrit for calm abiding. More specifically, what we will do is a single pointed meditation. So there are four instructions for shamatha practice. We already looked at the first one at the beginning of the session, which is the posture, the body posture. So ideally sitting in the seven point Buddha Vairochana posture. Remember, the most important is for the body to be upright. The second instruction is the object of meditation. What are we actually meditating on? If you're familiar with shamatha, you can use the object of meditation you're the most familiar with. Otherwise, I would recommend using the breathing sensation at the entrance of the nostrils. Try to place all your focus, all your attention on the breathing sensation at the entrance of the nostrils. Perhaps you feel as you breathe in, the air is a little bit cooler, as you breathe out a little bit warmer, between two breaths, it's a neutral. Try to focus on that 
breathing sensation this. The third instruction is that we tend to get distracted while we meditate and there are two main ways this happened. The first one is called mental excitement. We are distracted with thoughts, mostly thinking about the past, thinking about the future, not remaining on our object of meditation. The mind wanders. Some story is happening in our head. The second way we tend to get distracted is called mental laxity or mental dullness or lethargy. The mind starts to sink, we have a tendency to fall asleep, and therefore we also lose our object of meditation. So finally, there are two antidotes that we need to use to counteract these distractions. The first antidote is called alertness, or also called introspection. It is a small part of our mind that is checking. In the background, it is looking. What is the mind doing? Is it focused on the object of meditation? Or has it wandered in thoughts? Or is it falling into laxity? It is a little bit like a security camera in the corner of the mind that is checking. What is the mind doing? Is it meditating or is it not? And the moment this introspection notices that the mind is not focused on the object of meditation anymore, we make use of the second antidote, which is called mindfulness. And the role of mindfulness is to remember the object of meditation. So we bring the mind back onto the object of meditation. And try not to forget it anymore. Mindfulness is also synonymous with non-forgetfulness. So let us try to practice like so for about five minutes, making use of the antidotes remaining focused on our object of meditation.
gently come out of the meditation. And when you heard the sound, you know, if you have the feeling, oh, that was very short, I want to meditate more, this is a very good sign, you know. For us beginners, it is actually advised, you know, to keep our meditation sessions short and do more of those. Meditate for 5, 10, 15 minutes and do more of these sessions, at least once a day. You can try every morning, every evening, if you can, or even more, you know, you can do throughout the day, you can do, you know, make a pause and for 5 minutes, you try to use the two antidotes and remain focused on a single object. If we meditate for one, two, three hours, you know, at the end we might feel exhausted, we might feel tired, and the next time we see the meditation cushion, we don't want to meditate. But if after five minutes, you know, we have feeling that we want to meditate more, this is a very good sign that we will, you know, make the effort to do more sessions. Also, if we meditate for a long time, for many hours, you know, and we don't really make use of the antidotes, then we are just reinforcing our bad habits of getting distracted. If we sit for five minutes and we commit that we will do a session of five minutes of quality, you know, making extensive use of introspection and mindfulness, then gradually you will see that you will be able to remain focused on your object of meditation for longer and longer over time. Let us take a moment to dedicate the merits that we have accumulated this morning by meditating <clears throat> on shamatha and trying to generate bodhicitta so that we may soon, very soon, achieve the state of full enlightenment, full awakening, the state of Buddhahood, in order to be of benefit to countless sentient beings. May the precious minds of bodhicitta and the wisdom realizing the emptiness of objective existence. May these precious minds that have not yet arisen arise and grow. And may that which has already arisen never diminish but increase forevermore. May our spiritual guides, in particular His Holiness the Dalai Lama, have very long and healthy lives. And may they continue to teach us the methods free our minds from the afflictions and the karmas. May all the wars that are happening around the world immediately come to an end. May there be no new war, may there be no famine, may there be no epidemic, may there be no financial problems, may there be no disasters of the elements, natural catastrophes. And may peace and happiness prevail in everyone's hearts and lives. May the Dharma of Buddha Shakyamuni last for a very long time and may we never be separated from perfectly qualified teachers such as His Holiness the Dalai Lama. Thank you very much for joining us this morning and uh, we'll see you tomorrow and day after for the next meditation. Have a beautiful day. Bye-bye.